So, welcome to this 11th lecture in this lecture series on digital forensics with me, Joachim Shevrestal from the University of Skövde. And now we reach the stage when we're going to start discussing uh, FTK or Access Data Forensic Toolkit. Uh, and this lecture will actually be divided into two lectures because there is so much material to talk about. So, I want to divide it a little bit so that uh, I will not talk your ears off totally. Uh, so, let's begin. Uh, when you enter FTK, this is what you get to first, which is basically the database. Uh, and the, the database interface here is where you see the cases you have. You can see that I have two cases here, one called test case and one called general lab. Uh, and there is also a number of, of options that, that we're going to go through. Uh, what you should know here is that FTK works with the database, uh, uh, sort of in the bottom of it and the databases where all the cases and the case data is stored. Um, there are some interesting considerations to, to discuss when you're installing FTK. Uh, for instance, it's a good idea to have OneDrive uh, storing the database, OneDrive storing the actual F FTK program, and a third drive storing the case data. Uh, for performance reasons. Uh, I will leave you to go through the best practices for how to install FTK on your own. You can find that on the X Access Data webpage. Uh, so starting from top to bottom uh, with the database interface, it, I've already told you about the cases and this is the case listing, all the cases that are uh, active in the current database and if I click a case you can see that there are some uh, information about the case to the right. Uh, but perhaps more interesting is the menu at the top here. Uh, beginning from left to right we have File, which is basically a menu where you can exit FTK if you like, not very much to do there. Uh, but next we have the Database, and this is where you can administer things about the actual database. So for instance you can see, uh, or you can't see, but I'm logged in as a user called Joachim, and you can create and administer users in different ways in FTK. Uh, so and that's what you do under the database tab here so you see that I, I can log out if I want I can change my own password uh, I can administer users and I get to this interface uh, and here I can add uh, more users and you can have give users different roles and there is three rules with the first one which is the application administrator which is basically a user that can do everything and then there is the case admin administrator which can do everything about all cases but he can't do uh, administrative tasks to the database uh, finally there is one role called case reviewer which is used uh, if you want someone to review a case that someone worked on say that you want to give an investigator the right to look at information in a case then you can make him a, a case reviewer he will be able to review everything in the case but he will not be able to modify the case or do anything in the case really so that's all I'm gonna discuss about the database next we have the case tab uh, which is where you create a new case, you can open one of the existing cases or you can assign users to a case if you like. Uh, but the most interesting things here is the backup and restore features. Uh, as backup there are two ways to do a backup in FTK. The first one is backup and the second one is archive and those work in similar ways. Uh, however if you just do a backup there is uh, the, the, the case information uh, is copied in a way but it's still stored uh, somewhat in database. If you do an archive you do an R, uh, backup that is uh, removed from the database if you will. Uh, finally you have the archive and deattach which is that you make an archive, an archive package and then you remove the case from from the listing here. And then we have the restore features which is restore if you want to restore uh, and that can restore both from a backup and an archive, uh, but if the case is detached, then you have to do an attach. Uh, so that's that for the case, and then we have the tools where we can do, uh, for example, if we're running uh, FTK in distributed mode, we can have uh, additional processing engines here that work on our case processing tasks, which, which we're going to discuss later. I will leave you to uh, explore the tools here on your own if you like. Uh, there are some few preferences that you can set, sort of. Uh, for instance, the, where the license server is, is located, where 
uh, some log files for backup and ar archiving. You can even also configure KFF, which is the known file filter, which we will discuss in a little while. Uh, next we have manage, uh, and on manage you can do some things like uh, columns, carvers, uh, work with KFF, photo DNA. I will discuss all of those things later, and I've actually never ever managed those from within here because you can also do it from within the actual case. So, to really th try things out, and for the rest of this video, we're going to create a case and then we'll go through all the pre processing options. Uh, pre processing is a term that's described. Uh, that's used to describe the tasks that you choose to run on a piece of evidence at the same time that it's added to the case. So it's processing do, that you do uh, before working with a case. It can be things that you know that you usually want to do, such as uh, expanding compound files to be able to analyze uh, zip files and other archives properly. It could be, uh, well, photo DNA to detect certain pictures, and it can be the known file filter to exclude certain files, etc. Let's get into that. Uh, so, to create a new case, you go case, then you go new, and then we we get into this uh, case options dialog where we're going to name the case. So I'm going to name it test2. Uh, we can do a reference if we if we want. We don't need to. We can do a description which was, will basically show show up down here as a description and that's everything with it. So a description. This is a test case again. Uh, case folder directory. This is the subfolder uh, or the parent folder in which the case will reside. Uh, we can then choose to have a database location, uh, which is the database for this actual case, and I usually put it with the, together with the case uh, in the case folder. And that's basically uh, up to what you want. And you should notice here that there is a database for the case, which stores all the data about the case, but there is yet another date. It's separated from the database that's storing, that's used by uh, FTK. So there's two different databases in play here. Uh, next is the processing profile where we choose our uh, pre processing tasks, and you see that there is uh, a bunch of pre created profiles here. There's one called field mode and basic assessment. Those are the field mode basically does nothing except lets uh, so it lets you uh, quickly start analyzing your evidence uh, there is the basic assessment which uh, do some pre-processing tasks that are really quick and allows you to really uh, start working on your uh, on your case really quickly and then there is e-discovery and summation which I've never used and finally the forensic processing which is the standard processing options for for FTK but as good forensic experts, we're gonna do do customize so that we get a chance to go through all of the processing options. Uh, and you see now that I'm working from the process, uh, the forensic processing. So uh, this is a good time to see the default options for the forensic processing profile. <sighs> so starting from top to bottom with all the processing options that we have. Um, w you can see that we're now in the evidence processing tab here to the left and the options that we have are those. So beginning from top to bottom we have the first section here which has to deal with file hashes uh, and FTK uses file hashes in the following way. Uh, it can hash a file and thus create a fingerprint for the file and then you can do uh, sort of different things to it. So first you see here to the left there are three options for what file uh, hash hash algorithms to use MD5, SHA1 and SHA256 and that only creates a hash value for each file it takes the file as input and then outputs uh, one or more hash values uh, you can do this in different ways the first one here which is not on by default is flag du duplicate duplicate files and uh, that is used to make FTK evaluate the hash values for each and every file and see if there are any duplicates uh, and this is possible because of the way that hashes work you know that for one input value there can only be one hash value so if there are two uh, similar or if there are two uh, identical hash values that means that the two files must be uh, identical as well. So you uh, and that is a way that you can really speed up an examination if you have an examination with a very big uh, set. Let's say that you have uh, you're 
working with two backup sets of a computer. Then if you use flag duplicate files, that enables you to see the difference between the backups in a really nice way. Uh, then we have the KFF, which uh, has to be installed separately uh, here, so it's grayed out. But KFF uh, stands for Known File Filter, and it can be used to, when you have that enabled, you can uh, give FTK a large ha list of hash values for known files, you know, known file filters. You give FTK a long list of hashes of known files, such as installers, uh, uh, and I don't know, things that you know is uninteresting, and then you can run KFF to make uh, FTK uh, mark every file that's in the f filter. So it can work, uh, either either you input a, a list of files that you know is uninteresting, so you don't have to look at it, or let's say you, you work a child exploitation case, you can input a, a file with hash values of known child pornography pictures and then you can have FTK identify sh child pornography for you automatically. It's really nice. Uh, we have photo DNA which is oops uh, which is basically a way to use hashes to identify similar or identical pictures. So that's that for the hashes and duplicate uh, identification, which is really nice. I usually work with flag duplicate files at least. It's quite a time consuming process but it's very good. Um, next then, we have the uh, expand compound files, which is basically uh, making FTK expand different types of compound files such as, well, nowadays there are a lot of different compound files uh, out there. Uh, you see 7-zip, you can have Active Directory files, you can have, well, uh, EVTX, which is the Win Microsoft Event Logs, uh, Internet Explorer data, um, iOS backups, uh, and more and more things you can go through it on, on your own. Uh, what's important to know here is that if you know that you want to examine compound files, which is zip files, 7-zip, and all that things that we just saw, you have to expand them to be able to fully uh, look at them because uh, take for instance a zipped folder. Uh, looking at a zipped folder when it's in its archived state, uh, then it's hard and not to say impossible to know what data that is in there. So if you zip a text file for instance, it's not easy. You can't do a live search or uh, even an index search to figure out what the data, what, what's written in that text file. You have to expand it first. So expanding compound files is a very common pre-processing option. You should, however, know that it does take some extra time. And next are the file signature analysis and flag bad extensions. Uh, and file signature analysis is based and flag bad extensions in combination makes FTK. Uh, look at the file extension of each file, so it's it's going to go through all the files and say, hey, here's a JPEG, here's a PDF, here's a, a docx, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then it's going to look at the file header or the file, file signature for each and every file and see if there's a match, because uh, uh, changing the file signature or, sh no, changing the file extension of a file is a common way to try to hide data. So those two in combination will make FTK go, okay, here's a JPEG, let's see if it says J JFIF in the, in the file header. Oh, okay, it does, so let's go on. Or, no, it doesn't, I will flag that, there is something hinky here. Uh, next we have the entropy test, uh, and an entropy test is basically a function that tries to examine the randomness of the data in a file. And the idea here is that if you have an encrypted file, the data in the encrypted file will appear random. Uh, and then the uh, because of that the entropy test can sort of be a way to indicate if a file is encrypted or not. Uh, unfortunately there are a lot of other files uh, and file types that appear as random so the entropy test in my opinion is not very good. Uh, for instance uh, a lot of compound files will score high on the entropy test, some executables will score high on the entropy test and so on and so forth. Uh, search text index, this is where we create a text index that we can use uh, one to search for, uh, to do really quick index searches and two uh, in order to export um, a word list to use for password cracking. Uh, what's important here, uh, as we can see if we press index sing options, is how the index is created. Uh, remember the discussion that we had about letters, noise words, and spaces. 
uh, and remember then that letters are the letters or the signs that can appear in a word. Uh, noise word is noise words are words that are not considered a part of the index, and spaces is everything that divides word in an index. And what I want to tell you here is that everything present in the spaces list here uh, are signs that can never ever be part of a word in the index. Thus, you can never crack a password containing one of these signs nor can you search for any of these signs because they will not be part of the index. Only those up here will be part of the index. So if we know that we're gonna use uh, our index to search for, for example, um, a bracket, uh, then we have to remove the bracket from the spaces section and we have to add the bracket to the uh, letters section, like so and that's the same for each and every sign that we want to do that to. And there are also some other some other settings that we can do like the maximum word length, if, we, if we're gonna index binary files or not, we can set the maximum uh, amount of memory that can be used for the index and so on and so forth. There are also some uh, some words or some combinations that is to be ignored. We can add our hyphens and we can decide how to treat our hyphens um, and so on and so forth. And what you should know is that there is usually uh, one school in forensics that really doesn't re doesn't like the index because it takes too much time and so on and so forth. And then there is the school in forensics that has sort of a high belief in the index, believes too much in the index. But the index isn't really worth that much if you doesn't in understand the options. You have to know how the index will behave uh, in order to fully utilize it. So moving on. Uh, create thumb thumbnail for graphics. Well, that's simple. It makes FTK create thumbnails for all the graphics in the case, and that makes for quicker analysis because instead of having to load all the actual graphics when you're going to process them or analyze them, you just load thumbnails into the view list, and that's much quicker. Uh, create thumbnail for videos is the next one, and that basically creates one or more thumbnails for every video file, which is good if you want to analyze videos quickly. You can press thumbnails options to decide how often or how many thumbnails there will be for each and every video. Uh, you can either say that there will be uh, one thumbnail um, every so often in the video, or you can, like with an interval, or you can do it with a percent, so every tenth percent of the video there will be a thumbnail. Cancel, we're not gonna do that. Uh, you can generate common video file, which is basically making FTK process each and every video file and then store it in a common video format, if you want to do that. Uh, HTML and CSV file listing makes FTK create li file lists with all files in the case in HTML or CSV file format. And then we have data carve, which is making FTK carve for uh, specific types of data. And as you remember, a carver is uh, basically um, defining a signature and an end of file tag and having the program search the hard drive from the very beginning to the very end and find all files that are that matches the signature and try to rebuild them it's the way that you use to um, to try to rebuild deleted files uh, and as you can see here there are some carvers that are built into FTK uh, and you can select to choose the, the select to use those uh, you can make FTK uh, exclude KFF ignorable files those that we know that we don't need for the case uh, what you should know about data carving is that it's yet another very time-consuming uh, task. And then we have MetaCarve, which is uh, making the system for uh, search for delete directory entries. Uh, it's not carving for uh, metadata in files. It's making the the system carve for deleted directories. And uh, next we have one, a really cool option, which is OCR or optical character recognition and this is uh, a task that makes FTK look for texts in, in pictures and PDF files and so on and so forth and then stores the text as text and makes it searchable so and you can even add it to the text index so using OCR you can actually 
search for co text content in pictures and PDF files and that is really cool. Uh, so for instance if if we have a suspect that tried to be smart and he said well I'm not gonna store my password in a text file I'm gonna take a photo of it and store it in my computer then OCR will uh, actually um, be able to be able to detect that. Uh, then we have explicit image detection which you can use to uh, detect uh, certain pictures depending on uh, the level of naked skin and other parameters you have to have an add-on to use that so I'm not going to talk more about that uh, register report which is quite cool uh, it's used to make FTK generate registry reports from the register data in, uh, in the registry files in the case and you can define the templates uh, define a template to tell FTK what data to to extract which is cool uh, include deleted files makes FTK consider the deleted files uh, in the pre-processing and this is mostly uh, relevant in cases uh, within jurisdictions where you may not have uh, allowance to where you may not be allowed to uh, analyze the deleted files uh, then we have the Cerberus analysis which tries to identify malware uh, send email when the job is complete, explains itself, decrypt credent files, uh, tries to decrypt files that are encrypted with credent, uh, process internet browsing history for visualization, well it processes internet browsing history for visualization so you can do timelines and stuff like that, um, perform automatic encryption uh, or decryption, sounds very nice but it requires you to a input passwords on beforehand and it only works for EFS uh, encrypted files so if you have a case with EFS encrypted files and you know some passwords then you can enter the passwords here and have FTK decrypt them on the fly. Uh, it doesn't really decrypt everything as we would like it to do. Uh, language identification is also cool it will look through the contents of text documents and try to identify what language they're written in it works surprisingly well uh, I'm not sure if I've ever used it on a case, but I've tried it and it works. I've never had use for it, though. Uh, document content analysis, which is uh, an even more uh, fussy function, which tries to determine to some level of, uh, to some degree, the content of a document. Uh, entity extraction, which uh, tries to extract social security number, credit card number, phone number, and email addresses from uh, from documents and uh, never used it but could be cool generate system information that's a very good one uh, because what it does is that it uh, looks into the Windows registry files and grabs some information uh, such as the users on the system when it was installed and so on and so forth and present it nice and tidy with an FTK uh, finally here then we have the persons of, persons of interest uh, in which you can look ba basically look for contacts between different individuals so I've never used this but it, looking at a description for it it seems really co cool if it works I don't know so this was all for the evidence processing we have some refinement also that we're gonna look at and the refinement options here are basically uh, settings to decide what files to include in our pre-processing and for me as a Swede I commonly have access to everything and I'm allowed to analyze everything but there are jurisdictions where you may have to uh, restrict yourself to files within a certain time or date range files belonging to a certain users file of a certain type and so on and so forth and that's what you can set here uh, and finally you can create custom file identifiers so if there is a custom file that you want to analyze you can add that here uh, and there are actually cases I don't think that are this common nowadays but when people for instance create their own file types to hide data in and then if you can analyze how that file work you can add a custom file identifier here so cancel and when you decided on your profile then you click OK and the case will open for you and this actually takes a time and this is where we will stop 
and continue on next time we're going to look at the actual FTK interface and we're going to start by adding some uh, evidence and have it run the pre-processing options that we just choose and then we're going to look at the various function within FTK. So thank you for now and see you next time.